Good morning. Welcome to our Bible study this morning. This morning we're looking at part number two of, of uh, answering the question, do ghosts exist among us? Uh, I would really suggest that if you're listening to this series, uh, this lesson, you would be sure you listen to the previous lesson beforehand because I'll be referring to the previous lesson several different times during the course of this lesson. What we're doing is we're trying to answer the question, <clears throat> do ghosts exist today? And by ghosts, what I mean is, when a person dies, does their spirit come back to the earth and live among us? Interacting among, you know, talking to us, moving objects. <clears throat> do they exist among us as the spirits of dead people? Does that happen in today's time? In our last lesson we looked and we saw that the Bible made it plain. When a person dies, their spirit leaves their body and departs from the earth. There have been only a few cases in the Bible where a person who has died has come back to the earth and in every case that that's happened, it was when the Lord resurrected somebody from the dead in which their spirit re-entered their body, and their body then, with the spirit in it, walked among people. You don't find one example in the Bible where the Lord uh, sent a person's spirit back to the earth to live among us in spirit form. Whenever the Lord resurrects somebody, he always sends the spirit back into their body. And their body then, we can see them with our eyes, their spirit then inside their body, walks among us. Okay, that's important to understand. So as we continue with our lesson now this morning, please keep in mind, as I said in the previous lesson, we'll be looking at many different verses in this lesson this morning. If you have a hard time keeping up, we do have a written copy of this lesson on my blog. Just go to settledinheaven.wordpress.com. There you'll find a copy of this lesson in my blog. You're welcome to download it. You're welcome to print it out. You're welcome to share this with others. All I ask is that you please do not have monetary gain from this. Please don't sell this. I really believe the word of the Lord should be free to anyone who wants it. When you go to my blog, settledinheaven.wordpress.com, type in Ghosts, Do They Exist? Part 2. That'll be the text from this lesson that we're looking at this morning. But keep in mind, just like in the videos, there's two parts to this lesson. Likewise on my blog, there are two different entries. There they go, do they exist, one and part number two. Okay, for this morning's lesson, I would like us to start by looking at Ephesians 6. Now keep in mind, in our last study, we saw clearly the Bible tell us, when a person dies, their spirit departs from the earth, they go, uh, they enter into the hands of the Lord and he disposes with them as he will, either in heaven or in hell. But this person's spirit does not return to the earth. Only a few times did that actually take place where the Lord sent his spirit back to the earth, but in every case, you have a person's spirit entering in their bodies and then being resurrected out of their tomb where their bodies and their spirits were united as they walked among us. You never have the Lord sending a person's spirit back to the earth without re-entering their body first. Okay, that's important to understand. Okay, so the next question we have to answer then is this. Okay, if that's the case, if the spirits of those who have died before us do not come back to the earth, is there such a thing as spirits being among us then? Absolutely. Absolutely. They're not the spirits of dead individuals, but there is a type of spirit being that lives among us. The Bible is plain about that. And so I would like us to look at several different verses in the Bible that clearly indicate, even though the spirits of dead people do not live among us, there are spirits that do live among us. Listen to Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now listen to this. 
For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There the Lord makes it plain that as Christians we are in spiritual warfare. It's against spiritual darkness in this world. Folks, there are spirit beings that live among us, some of which oppose our service to the Lord. Now, very quickly, without getting into a great amount of detail, who are these spirits? They're fallen angels. Keep in mind that Satan and angels were cast out of heaven. At that point in time, they were cast onto the earth. I believe some of those fallen angels are now in hell. But there are some fallen angels that are here on earth, including Satan himself. They're referred to in the Bible as, you know, angels at times. They're referred to as demons. They're referred to as unclean spirits. They're referred to as familiar spirits. There's many different titles given to these spirit beings that live among us. But the point I want us to see in today's lesson is there are spirits among us. Not only are they made up of fallen angels, but there are some of God's angels among us as well that God sends to protect his people. Before the word of God was completed, he used to send angels to the earth to deliver his message to people. There are ministering spirits who help us to serve the Lord just as much as there are unclean spirits that oppose our service to the Lord. So we have both elect and uh, fallen angels among us on earth. They're the ones that make up the spirits that are around us. And that's why the Lord says... We're at war against them. The fallen angels that are opposing our service to him is like we're in a war. Listen to Romans 8, 38. I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Notice here that angels are one of the beings that we are said to oppose and to be trying to separate us from the love of the Lord. Notice in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. Why is it some people don't come to a saving knowledge in Christ? It's because the God of this world hath blinded them. Who is the God of this world? Satan himself. He's the God of this world. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Listen to Acts 26, 17, 18. Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, listen to this, to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God. See, right there in the context, we're talking about the same principle of spiritual blindness. In one verse, we're told that we are blinded by the God of this world. In the other verse, we're told that our spiritual blindness... Uh, <coughs> is brought upon by the power of Satan. And the idea is this, when the Lord opens up our blinded eyes, he's opening our eyes, he turns us from darkness to light, he's turning us, when he opens up our blinded eyes, he's turning us from the power of Satan unto the power of God. So see, there again, you can see how Satan is active in this world around us as a spirit being. He blinds the eyes of the lost around us. The Lord said unto Satan, Whence cometh thou, Satan? This is Job 1, seven. Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. There in Job, Satan himself says, Look, I'm walking up and down on this earth. I'm trying to find servants of the Lord to oppose. In 1 Peter 1, five, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. There again, we're told clearly, Satan does walk among us. He's looking for people to devour like he's a roaring lion. In other words, a hungry lion walking about, trying to seek people that he can devour. Folks, spirit beings are among us. We need to understand that. But the spirits that are among us are not the spirits of dead people who have passed. They're the spirits of fallen angels, Satan. And other fallen angels that are out to oppose our service to Christ. That's what a demon is. It's a fallen angel seeking to oppose us. And yes, demons are present today, just like they were present in New Testament times. Yeah. 
you might say, okay, how do we know that angels are even described as spirits in the Bible? Well, in Hebrews 1, 13 and 14, listen to this. But to which of the angels said he at any time, set on my right hand and try make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? Right there, angels are described as spirits. You have the same thing in Psalm 104.4. Who maketh his angels spirits, his ministers a flaming fire. So, folks, angels are spirits. Why are angels called spirits? It's because they don't have fleshly bodies. They're entities that do not have physical fleshly bodies. Therefore, they are called spirits. You can even look at the Lord himself. The third person of the Godhead is called the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. Why is he given the title of ghost or spirit? He does not have a physical fleshly body. So the idea of a spirit is, at least a part of what's involved with the idea of being a spirit, is not having a physical fleshly body. That's why angels are described as spirits in the Bible. So once again, when you read about spirits in the Bible, depending on the context, many times it's talking about angels who live among us, whether fallen or whether elect, that are intervening in our lives. The fallen angels are seeking to oppose our service to the Lord. Elect angels are there to minister to us, to, to help us as we seek to serve the Lord. That explains why in Job 4, 15 through 21, Then a spirit passed before my face, and the hair of my flesh stood up. It stood still, but I could not discern the form thereof. An image was before mine eyes. There was silence, and I heard a voice saying, Shall mortal man be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? Behold, he put no trust in his servants, and his angels he charged with folly. How much less in them that dwell in houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust, which are crushed before the moth. They are destroyed from morning to evening. They perish forever without regarding it. Doth not their excellency which is in them go away? They die even without wisdom. Now here the main point I want us to see is, yes, throughout the Bible people see spirits. In this case, in Job 4, 15 through 21, he says, A spirit passed before my face, the, the hair of my flesh stood up. Just because people see spirits in the Bible, that doesn't mean they're seeing the spirits of dead men who have come back to the earth. It doesn't mean that at all. It's saying they're seeing angels. Again, whether it would be fallen angels or elect angels, depending on the context, whenever you have people seeing spirits or experiencing spirits in their life in the Bible, they're talking about angelic beings. That was the case in Job. Even the Lord's followers, they acknowledge that spirits exist. And notice in Matthew 14, 24 through 27. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch, the same night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. Listen, they recognize the fact spirits exist. When they saw Christ walking on the water, they didn't recognize who he was. So they're, in their minds, they thought, man, this must be some type of a spirit being because he's walking on the water. Yeah, they acknowledge spirits exist, but there's no reason to believe that they believed it was a dead man who's come back to the earth. They were thinking this was some type of an angel, a spirit being, one that didn't have a fleshly body walking on the earth. And if you notice, Jesus didn't correct them. He didn't stop and say, you know, there's no such thing as spirit beings on the earth. He didn't say that. Here's what he said. Be of good cheer as I, be not afraid. Now, personally, I believe, and if you study Christ as he taught his disciples, many, many times Christ would take advantage of teaching uh, opportunities when he was with his disciples. Here was a perfect teaching opportunity for him. If there's no such thing as spirits that live among men, Christ could have easily said, wait a minute, guys. There's no such thing as spirits. When you looked out and saw me on the water, you should have known it was me. There's no such thing as a spirit. Christ didn't say that at all. He said, be of good cheer as I, be not afraid. Christ was acknowledging, yes, there are spirits. 
But in this case, you have nothing to fear because it's me. It's not an evil spirit. <clears throat> Let's look, we could please, at Luke 24, 36 through 40. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. Listen to this. Again, this is his followers who had been taught by the Lord himself. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed they had seen a spirit. So here they're looking at Christ. They're afraid that they had seen a spirit. This was after they saw him die on the cross. He now is resurrected. They think he's a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? Why do your thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is myself. Handle me and see. A spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. Look, folks, even concerning the resurrection of Christ, he did not come back as a spirit being. He re-entered his body. And his body came out of the tomb. His spirit inside of his body came out of the tomb. He was a human being with a spirit in him. He was God himself, but he was a human being with a spirit in him walking among men, even after his resurrection. So even Christ himself didn't come back as a spirit being on earth. Here he says, look, feel my hands and my feet. You'll see that I have flesh and bones. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. So again, Christ is acknowledging several things. He's acknowledging that spirits exist. He's acknowledging that spirits don't have flesh and bone bodies. That's one of the things that makes them a spirit. And once again, he could have easily explained to them, look, there's no such thing as spirits on the earth. So you, you were mistaken in thinking I was a spirit. No, he didn't take advantage of that opportunity at all. He simply said, if you feel me, you'll see. I'm not a spirit. So it's almost as if the Lord is affirming, yeah, there are spirits that are present, but the way you can tell the difference is, I've got flesh and bones, so that tells you I'm not a spirit, as compared to spirits that do exist. See, folks, I just want you to understand that all of these verses that we've looked at so far this morning makes it clear. There are spirit beings among us. Once again, I know I've said this probably, if I've said it once, I've said it a hundred times, but hear me one more time. The spirit beings that are among us are not the spirit of dead individuals who have died and have now come back living among us. The spirit beings the Bible always talks about are fallen angels or elect angels that are living among us, that are either opposing our service to the Lord or aiding in our service to the Lord, depending on what type of angel they are. Look at Judges 9.23. Then God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem, and the men of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech. Right there you can see there are even times when God uses evil spirits because he's the sovereign Lord. And again, this is a whole other lesson I'm not going to begin to get into explaining how God can even use evil spirits to do his purposes, but he does. My point is for this lesson, you can see evil spirits exist. They do come into this earth. They do intervene among men. When he had called unto him his twelve disciples, this is Matthew 10, 1, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out. Okay, what would we call those? Demons. What else do we call those? Fallen angels. They're all the same. They're spirit beings that live among us. In this case, during the New Testament times, they were able to actually indwell and possess people. And Christ gave his apostles the ability to cast them out. To prove that he is king and kings and lord of lords even over the demons. In Mark 1, 23-27, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. He cried out, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? <clears throat> uh, and Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For what authority commanded he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him? This verse makes it easy for us to understand why did the Lord allow demons in New Testament times to possess people? It was to prove his authority over them. Listen, when the Lord was able to cast out demons, or when his followers were able to cast out demons, that proved that their authority and their power was greater than those demons. 
Now keep in mind, we were told in the previous verse that Christ gave his followers authority to cast out demons. So the authority came from the Lord. The Lord has authority over demons. And to prove that, during New Testament times, he allowed demons to possess men. And so he was able to cast those demons out. And his followers were able to cast those demons out to prove to people, to be an outward testimony of the fact he had authority over demons. Just like raising the dead in New Testament times. Why did the Lord allow that to take place? To prove he had authority over death. So you found the Lord resurrecting people. You found his followers resurrecting people. To prove this God that they served, the Lord Jesus Christ, Jehovah God, has authority over death. There's many things that took place in New Testament times that don't take place today. And I believe spirit possession is one of those. I'm not so sure spirits actually can possess people in today's time. They can certainly oppress people in today's time. But I'm not quick to say they can actually possess someone in today's time. I believe the Lord allowed it to happen back then for him to be able to prove he had authority over the powers of darkness, the spiritual wickedness that dwells in the earth today. Likewise, the resurrection thing. I believe the reason why the Lord was uh, allowed dead people to be resurrected was to prove he had authority over death. We now have a written account of all these things that happened. The resurrections from the dead that the Lord performed. The casting out of demons the Lord performed. We now have a written record in the Bible. We don't need to see that with our eyes today. The written record tells us that our God has authority over these things. It's a matter now of us simply trusting God's word, believing the account God gave us. It's an issue of faith. Okay, but anyhow, the point is, yes, spirits do dwell among us. Yes, they do oppose our service to the Lord. No, they are not the spirits of dead men who have come back to the earth. <clears throat> the two issues in the Bible that are most used to prove that spirits do come back is found in 1 Samuel 28, 11 through 20, and also 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. I'm sorry. Let's say one at a time, okay? 1 Samuel 28, 11 through 20, and then the other one is Matthew 17, 1 through 9. Let's take them one at a time. 1 Samuel 28, 11 through 20 is a story of King Saul going to the witch at Endor. I'm not going to take the time to read these verses. But the idea is this. You have King Saul going to the witch at Endor, wanting her to call up Samuel who had died. He wants her to call up Samuel because he wants to ask Samuel questions about the future of the nation of Israel. Okay? King Saul is going against the will of the Lord. The Lord made it plain that a person should not go after uh what we call channelers in today's time <clears throat> to try and get advice or to try and, and get uh, speak to people that are dead. The Lord makes it plain that we should not do these things. It's a grave sin in his eyes. King Saul chose to do it anyhow. If you read the account in 1 Samuel 28, 11 through 20, you find that, a, a, that when this witch does try to conjure up Samuel, this being does appear. Saul recognizes this being as Samuel. The being then delivers a message to Saul that involves the truth. I mean, what he tells Saul is the truth. Many people say, see, in that case you have a, a, the spirit of Samuel being sent back to the earth to communicate with King Saul. Okay. I think a big part of understanding what actually took place is found in 2 Corinthians 11, 13-15. If you read that section of scripture, it talks about how Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. I believe Saul didn't actually see Samuel, but he saw a demon masquerading as Samuel. The demon did deliver a truthful message. Right here in 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15, it says such too. It says, look, many times the ministers of Satan are transformed as ministers of righteousness. They look like ministers of righteousness. Even their message many times can contain spiritual truth. Look, let me tell you something. There are people out there who claim to be ministers of the Lord who proclaim a lot of spiritual truth. 
but then they get off in some areas. They use the truth they proclaim to mislead people, and so the people learn to trust them because, yeah, they're teaching a lot of truth. Then when they get off the path of truth and when they teach error, people don't recognize it as error because they've learned to trust them. Satan does that a lot. Just because somebody stands up and teaches something that is truthful, that doesn't mean they're a minister of the Lord or they're come from the Lord. In this case, it's the same thing, I believe. Just because Samuel spoke truth to King Saul, I believe it was speaking truth to mislead King Saul. It had nothing to do with proving that Samuel was actually Samuel, that Saul saw. Let me explain that again. Why did this demon speak the truth to Saul? It was so Saul would believe that the demon was Samuel. It was a part of him misleading Saul. Why is it important what Saul believed? Folks, Saul had gone against the will of the Lord. Saul knew he was sinning when he did this very action. But this justified what Saul had done. It said, look, See, Samuel did come back. Maybe I didn't do what's wrong after all. The same thing now. When we read this as generations past, as we read this account, and as we see this demon speaking the truth, it makes many people wonder whether that wasn't really Samuel. It's playing right into the hands of, of false teachers who say, yeah, the spirit of dead men do come back. Samuel's proof of it. Listen, would the Lord have, have allowed Saul to accomplish what he set out to do through lies, through deceit, through sin? Think about it. All along, King Saul wanted to receive the word of the Lord, but instead of going to the Lord and praying and getting the word from the Lord, he went through this sinful way of going about getting the word of the Lord. You think the Lord would bless him and say, Yes, yeah, Saul, even though you're doing this in sinful ways, let me give you the truth through Samuel? I don't believe for a second that would happen that way. The Lord would not justify what King Saul had done by granting him the truth through this sinful means. When Saul on purpose knew what he was doing all along. But Satan would sure want to mislead not only Saul, but Satan would want to mislead multitudes of people throughout the ages that would read this account and believe this really was Samuel come back from the dead to bring a message to Saul. So as far as I'm concerned, what took place here, you have a fallen angel perhaps even Satan himself, I don't know, but it was some fallen angel masquerading as Samuel, delivering the truth to mislead people about this very issue that we're talking about. The other issue in the Bible is the issue concerning <clears throat> the transfiguration in Matthew 17, 1 through 9. The Mount of Transfiguration where you have the Lord appearing with Moses and Elijah, if you remember that. Many people say, there you see it, Moses and Elijah, they were spirits now that came back to the earth appearing to men. Well, if we study uh, Matthew 17, 1 through 9, let me just read a few select verses. You come back and read this for yourself. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. You have the Lord standing talking to Moses and Elias. The key to understand what took place here is at the very end of this section of scripture where it says, Jesus charged them. He's talking now to Peter, James, and John. They were the ones that saw this on Mount of Transfiguration take place. He speaks to Peter, James, and John, and he says, Tell the vision to no one. Right there we've got it. This was a vision they had. Meaning what? Moses and Elias weren't actually present with the Lord. It was simply a vision that they had. Remember the visions that John had in Revelation? For example, one of the visions was an animal that had, you know, seven heads and ten horns. For example, well, there wasn't a real animal that existed like that. It was simply a vision that God had given to him to express to him spiritual truth. Same thing here. The Mount of Transfiguration experience, 
the appearance of Moses and Elias was a vision. Jesus himself said so. He said, don't tell this vision to no man. They had a vision. Does that mean literally Moses and Elijah had shown up with the Lord on the Mount of Transfiguration? Absolutely not. They weren't literally there. It was simply a vision. God caused them to see these things to express a spiritual truth. What was the spiritual truth expressed to them? Two things. First of all, it accredited the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures. Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. When they were standing with Christ, what was being said was this. The message of Moses was fulfilled in Christ. The message of Elijah or the message of the prophets was also fulfilled in Christ. So you have the three of them now standing that was proof that Jesus was the Messiah. So not only did it accredit God's words saying what Moses and Elijah said was the truth, you have that proven in the life of Christ, but also you have then also the principle, Christ is the true Messiah. Because he fulfilled what Moses had written in the Old Testament, and he was the fulfillment of what Elijah and the other prophets wrote in the Old Testament as well. So Moses and Elijah standing for the Old Testament scriptures with Jesus with them proved you can trust the Old Testament scriptures as the truth, but also it proves that Jesus was the true Messiah that fulfilled Old Testament scriptures. That's what it's all about, folks. That's what the Mount of Transfiguration showed to Peter, James, and John. It was a vision given to them by God to express a spiritual truth to them. So to summarize our study, no when a person passes away, he does not come back and live on the earth among men as a spirit. Never happens. But yes, there are spirit beings that exist among us. They're fallen angels, otherwise known as demons, familiar spirits, any one of a number of terms. Not only that, there's some elect angels as well dwelling among us that either oppose our service to the Lord or they help us in our service to the Lord, depending on which type of angel they are. Of course, we know elect angels are the ones that would help us as we serve the Lord. Fallen angels are the ones that would oppose us as we seek to serve the Lord. I hope this helps to clarify some of the basic principles behind answering the question, do ghosts exist among us? Thank you very much for spending time to study the Word of God. May the Lord bless you. Goodbye.